Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're taking a look at the new Intel Core i9-13900KS. This one's in the Thelma Grizzly contact frame, which is why it looks a bit different than normal. And also we've had to cover up where we got it from because this is not part of the official review program. If there is one, uh, we acquired a confidential chip from, well, somewhere. Anyway, this is the 13900KS and it is very similar to the 1200KS and 9900KS that came before it. So that is to say this special edition product is nothing more than a mildly overclocked version of the original. Sure, it might be bin silicon, but for the most part, that just means it's a whisker faster and a boatload more expensive. How much faster and how much more expensive? We'll get to in a moment, but before we do... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Gigabyte and their NVIDIA GeForce RTX 30 series of graphics cards. For gamers seeking a premium experience, the Aorus range offers a number of excellent models such as the Extreme, Master and Water Force. All models include high-end coolers, either with massive triple fan heat sinks or large radiators in the case of the Water Force series. These aggressive performance focused designs ensure optimal operating temperatures and maximum power delivery. They're also very eye-catching with stunning RGB visual effects and of course with the ability to support ray tracing and DLSS, you can enjoy breathtaking in-game visuals. For our Aussie viewers, these models are also available in pre-built systems from M-Wave, PLE, Scorptech and Senacom. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so if you're familiar with the Core i9-13900K, getting up to speed with the KS version, it's not gonna take long. The thermal velocity boost frequency has been increased from 5.8 gigahertz to six gigahertz. The P-Core base frequency has also been increased from three gigahertz to 3.2 gigahertz. And this has raised the base TDP from 125 watts to 150 watts, while the max turbo power remains the same at 253 watts. And well, you're now up to speed. So that's it, a 7% increase to the base clocks and a 3.5% boost to the peak operating frequency. Actually, no, that's not it. I forgot one minor detail, the price. Currently, Intel's charging customers $600 US for the standard 13900K. And although I don't have the official MSRP for the new KS version, as Intel never sampled us or gave us any information about these parts, but locally here in Australia, the 13900KS is set to cost $1,260, up from $1,000 for the standard model. So that's a 26% price premium for what might amount to around a 5% performance improvement. And that 26% margin seems about right. The 12900K, for example, launched at $650 US and can be had for $430 US today, while the 12900KS that launched at $800 US and can be had for $520 US today. So that's a 23% launch premium and a 21% premium at present. So therefore it stands to reason that the 13900KS will be coming in at at least a 20% premium, but probably closer to 30%, which is crazy given what it is. Now, normally I have quite a few application and gaming benchmarks for you, but as you're about to see, in terms of performance, there's generally very little difference between the K and KS model. So rather than spend 20 minutes going over dozens upon dozens of graphs, I'll speed up the process by reducing the amount of applications we're gonna look at while skipping most of the individual game results for the 11 game average. Also, full disclaimer, the 13900KS was benchmarked using the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 420 millimeter AIO with the Thermal Grizzly CPU contact frame installed, and this did improve the all-core clocks when compared to the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2 FX 360mm AO, which we normally test with without the contact frame. And I will show you those results in a moment. As for testing, I'll be using a GeForce RTX 4090, Windows 11, and Resize Bar was enabled for all test configurations. Okay, let's get into it. Before we get into the blue bar graphs though, here's a look at the all-core behavior in Cinebench R23. On average, we saw a package power of 280 watts with a peak of 300 watts, and this allowed for an average clock frequency of 5,480 megahertz. For reference, the 13900K saw the same package power figures, but only sustained a frequency of 5,330 megahertz, making the KS model around 3% faster. Interestingly, when running the single core Cinebench R23 test, we saw a typical operating frequency of 5,580 MHz with random and very brief spikes up to 5,985 MHz. Now, the biggest issue with the 13900KS is, surprise, surprise, power and thermals. The same issue with the 13900K and then the 12900K before it. After just a matter of seconds when running an all core workload, the 13900KS spikes to at least 100 degrees at which point core throttling is triggered, 
dropping package power from 300 watts to 260 watts. Now using the Be Quiet Pure Loop 2FX 360mm IO, the 13900KS ran at an average of 5370MHz, which is only 40MHz higher than the 13900K as both are thermally limited in our testing. But as I noted earlier, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 420mm IO with the Thermal Grizzly CPU contact frame allowed the 13900KS to sustain a clock speed of 5480MHz, and this is after an hour of looping Cinebench R23. Given that's only a 3% increase over the 13900K, and most people interested in the 13900KS will be looking to upgrade their cooling, I think benchmarking with the Arctic Liquid Freezer and Contact Frame makes the most sense, so we're going to do that. Okay, so here are the Cinebench R23 scores taken after a 10 minute loop. The 13900KS improved upon the original model score by just 5%, scoring 40,789 points, making it 7% faster than the 7950X. We're also looking at a 5% increase in single core performance over the 13900K, or a 6% increase when using the faster DDR5 7200 memory. The gains in Photoshop are minimal. Here the 13900KS provided a meager 3% performance improvement, achieving a score of 1,665 points, compared to the 1,612 points provided by the original 13900K. The Blender open data results are really disappointing. Here we're looking at a 1% increase in performance, one whole percent improved. Then arming the 13900KS with DDR5 7200 got the margin to 3%. So the faster memory is making the biggest difference in this test. The only impressive aspect of the 13900KS so far is power consumption. And although power usage in general for these Core i9 parts is actually very unimpressive, relative to the 13900K, we're getting a little extra performance at no real cost to power usage. The higher quality bin silicon is able to run at slightly lower voltages, resulting in the figures that we see here. When compared to the 7950X though, total system usage is around 40% higher with the i9 part, which is really bad given the Ryzen 9 processor was 12% faster in this test. So the 13th gen Core i9 series is a disaster for productivity when it comes to power usage, and while you can limit the power, that does limit performance, handing the 7950X a larger performance advantage. Time for some gaming benchmarks, and there's really no good way to break this news, so here it is. The 13900KS is 1.3% faster than the 13900K in Hitman 3 at 1080p with an RTX 4090. That said, you can achieve a massive 4% boost, yep, that was sarcasm, if you use DDR5 7200 memory while leaving the 13900K with DDR5 6400. I suppose using 7200 memory for both CPUs will likely see the return of that 1% margin. Here we're looking at a 1.5% performance boost in Horizon Zero Dawn for the 13900KS while using DDR5 7200 memory, boosted performance by a further 2%, hitting 218 FPS. Again, we're looking at very uninspiring gains in Cyberpunk 2077. Here, the 13900KS offered a 1% performance gain, going from 217 to 219 FPS. Wow, feel that difference. This did make the DDR5 7200 gains look rather impressive though, hitting 228 FPS, which is a mere 4% boost, but still compared to 2 FPS, that's kind of nice. The Rift Breaker is a benchmark that Intel does very well in. The 13900K, for example, is 2% faster than the 7700X. Though here the 13900KS only delivers an extra percent, so 2 FPS more. It would seem as though the biggest advantage here is brought to you by the DDR5-7200 memory, as the extra bandwidth provided a reasonably impressive 11% performance uplift hitting 229 FPS. FPS mad CSGO players will enjoy a massive 20 FPS boost at 1080p with the RTX 4090, though that is just a 4% increase. But for the 13900KS, that's a big result. And if you opt for DDR5-7200 memory, you can push that up to 544 FPS. Last up, before we take a look at the 11 game average, here's the newest addition to the CPU testing, a Plague Tower Requiem. Here the 13900K was good for 120 FPS on average, which made it just 3% slower than the 7700X. However, the 13900KS was able to match the 7700X, so a 3% boost over the 13900K, and then armed with DDR5-7200 memory, we extracted a further 3% performance. 
Okay, so here's a look at the 11 game average, and as found previously, the 7700X and 13900K are neck and neck. That being the case, the on average 2% increase for the 13900KS meant it was a whopping 2% faster than the 7700X. So yeah, all that extra heat and power for a measly 2% boost on average. Then with DDR5 7200, which the 7700X can't use, the 13900KS was 5% faster. Then, for those of you interested, here's the 1440p data. Under these slightly more GPU limited test conditions, the 13900KS was 2% faster than the 13900K, so that's rather pointless. Well, I wasn't that impressed with the 13900K when I reviewed it back in October, so as you'd probably expect, I'm none too impressed with the KS version. It basically takes all the dumb attributes of the original and just doubles down on them, resulting in basically no extra performance and a huge price premium. So just what we've come to expect from Intel's KS processors. Of course, these special edition processors are meant for extreme overclockers and I guess enthusiastic overclockers in general. So if you see value in paying over a 20% premium for what is meant to be bin silicon, then I guess fine. For everyone else though, they just make no sense. And I feel the same can really be said about the 13900K. Typically speaking, the Ryzen 9 7950X is a bit cheaper though the savings there are eaten up by the motherboard costs, but it is also the superior productivity CPU, generally offering greater performance at significantly lower power consumption. The memory costs, in my opinion, are irrelevant here, as you wouldn't and really shouldn't pair the Core i9 processor with DDR4 memory. Now, the 7950X, it might like to run at 95 degrees, but it doesn't throttle, and it is easy to keep at that temperature with a basic cooler. Meanwhile, the 13900K wants to exceed 100 degrees with a 360mm I.O. and therefore does have to thermal throttle. The Core i9 part also dumps significantly more heat into your case, and if that sounds trivial to you, trust me it's not. I game using a 12900KS, and it's a real pain, and as such I will be doing away with it later this year. For gaming though, I'd rather use the Ryzen 7 7700X, or the more efficient 7700 version, though you can undervolt and or use eco mode with the 7700X. Anyway, it's a significantly more power efficient part that delivers 13900K light gaming performance for well under $400 US. That said, if your primary concern is gaming, then right now you are best off waiting until Zen 4 3D vCache parts land next month and check out what they have to offer. The 13900KS though, it just ain't it. It's a dumpster fire of a processor, and at the expected price tag of $1,260 Australian, and at least $700 US, it's just a joke. I guess at the right price, this could be a great product, as you just power limit it for more sane operating temperatures, but if you're going to do that, then the 13900K obviously makes more sense. So as I've said, short of extreme overclockers, this is a seriously dumb product that you should avoid. And that's probably why Intel hasn't sampled the 13900KS, at least they didn't to us. We didn't sign an NDA, so we could have released this review at any time, but I believe we are going live at the official time and date out of respect for other reviewers, just in case they were sampled and also wasted their time with this toaster. Anyway, I am done here. If you enjoyed this video, do hit the like button. You can subscribe for more content. Also, we have Floatplane Patreon. If you want to become a Harborbox community member, you'll gain access to exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, Q&A series, and behind the scenes content. A lot of cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check it out. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.